We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. For the people online, thank you for joining. For the people in Katowice, uh, uh, nice you made the travel. It's unfortunate that uh, that we cannot be here uh, with you. Um, um, it, it is what it is. This is uh, uh, what we do nowadays. And I hope that this is, uh, uh, an, this is going to be a, a nice hybrid way of, uh, of, of debating. I hope it will work. Today, um, we're going to talk about uh, digital uh, uh, autonomy together. It's a session that is organized by uh, the Dutch IGF, NLIGF, and uh, uh, ECP, which is a public-private uh, uh, organization for the Information Society. And during this talk, we're going to, or during this panel discussion, we're going to, to look at, into a number of questions. Questions about regulation, competition, and innovation. How uh, regulatory and self-regulatory frameworks can help foster more competitive internet-related markets, a larger diversity of business models, and more innovation. How uh, to enable equitable access to data, marketplaces, or infrastructures for fostering competition and innovation on the internet. Data governance and trust globally and locally. What is needed to ensure that existing and future national and international data governance frameworks are effective in mandating the responsible and trustworthy use of data with respect to privacy and other human rights. So that those set of questions are usually framed in, in, in terms of digital uh, autonomy or, or maybe digital uh, sovereignty. And we have some questions around the risk thereof. In what way could pursuing digital autonomy lead to a splinter net? And what would be the day-to-day -day risk of pursuing digital autonomy on a national or even regional level? So we have a panel. Um, uh, my name is Olaf Kolkman. Um, I'm principal at the Internet uh, uh, Society. Um, and we have a panel of uh, a number of persons. Um, Gagana Petrova from uh, the RIPE NCC. She is uh, external relations officer over there and she has in, uh, expertise in internet governance, academic engagement and online uh, learning. We have uh, Chris Buckridge. He's also from the RIPE NCC. Um, he's the advisor to the managing director of the RIPE NCC on issues of global strategic engagement with, organization, with the organization's full range of stakeholders. Um, we thought we would have Hanane Bujemi, but unfortunately uh, she couldn't make it. She sends her apologies. Um, but we found, and he is in um, in uh, in Katowice, uh, uh, Rulof Meyer to be willing to speak on the topic. And Rulof is an active member in the Dutch IGF, um, and he is also the CEO of SIDN, the organization that manages the Dutch top-level domain. Um, we also have uh, Lucevis van der Vlaan. She is also in Katowice. Um, Lucevis is an ex member of parliament, an ex board, uh, ICANN board member, and uh, executive uh, director uh, at Transparency International in the Netherlands. I think you also have a role with the consumer uh, 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 union nowadays. I'm not 100% sure. That's can... right. I just uh, became a chair of the ah. Dutch Consumer Association, but that's very fresh information. So you're totally on the ball. Cool. I was not even on LinkedIn yet. Um, and, and finally, we have uh, uh, Nadia Chaya, and she's a uh, PhD fellow at uh, Unu, Unu Chris and the VUB, which I think is the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. And she's working on the project of uh, the contribution of global and regional multi-stakeholder mechanisms in improving global governance, Gremlin. Uh, uh, 
uh, you can tell uh, this is uh, uh, something in the internet field because there is a cool acronym. Um, for starters, um, we are talking about uh, uh, digital autonomy. And uh, I, I uh, assume that is a term that means a lot of things to a lot of people and potentially uh, all kinds of different things to uh, uh, different people. So I, I want to do a quick round uh, uh, with you all, uh, my panelists, um, to understand what you think or how you define what digital autonomy is. What will you be talking about when you talk about digital autonomy? Um, let me start with Nadja and then uh, work my way uh, 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 through all the panelists. Nadja, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I think I would like to, to start off with uh, going top down, starting from digital sovereignty, um, which you mentioned before, which is, uh, as you mentioned, a term in the making. And you'll see throughout the IGF also yesterday that there have been many sessions with efforts to kind of define what it means. But I find that the ways in which it's being used lead us to think that the world is being divided in kind of binary divisions, kind of friend, enemy, competition, cooperation, and then you have sovereignty and autonomy. And we're doing this uh, in a world where black and white solutions to these complex issues aren't going to take us very far. So digital sovereignty plays off interest, partnerships and independence against interdependence, global networks, and interoperability requirements for global communications. But I believe that when we talk about digital sovereignty, we really need to break it down to different aspects and more importantly, where it is political narrative and then where it really matters in our day-to-day -day functions. So I'd like to move swiftly away from the political narrative and look more a little bit at the day-to-day -day. and as an end user, as an individual, what does that mean to me? So when I talk to friends about digital sovereignty, many think about their data, their privacy, ownership, but also their identity because all these things are linked to them as a person. When you buy something online, you buy it with, with your or, or with someone else's credit card, which relates to a bank account that you can only get with your identity card or your passport. But I'm speaking here then of digital autonomy, the right to make your own informed and uncoursed decision. So um, if I then wanted to summarize um, digital sovereignty, there are many different ways it's being presented, such as cyber sovereignty or technical, technological sovereignty or data sovereignty. Um, but I'll take an academic stance on it and say Westphalian concept of sovereignty, which is state centric. And then you have digital autonomy, which is the right to make your own informed on course decision, which is more about you as an individual. And then I question uh, the future and then look at your own self sovereign identity. And I think for now, I'll leave it here. Thank you. Um... That's already a, 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 an insightful way to, to split things up. But um, uh, Chris, maybe you want to sure. share your um, idea about this. Okay. Um, thank you, Ola. Um, thank you, Nadia. Thank you, everyone. It's really nice to be here. And sorry, I can't be there um, in person. Um, I, I really like the title of this, this session. And I think I'm sort of edging onto Nadia's territory here when I sort of point out that digital sovereignty seems to be the term used more often and used very regularly um, in a lot of the sessions planned for this, this IGF. And, and that makes sense. I mean, that's, that's the term that the EU institutions have been using um, and it, it does refer very much to sort of state frameworks, law, legal frameworks, et cetera. I think it's really important and really useful to sort of bring it back to the idea of autonomy, which is a much, much less sort of state-based idea. It's, it's an idea that's really baked into the, the, the idea of the internet itself from very early on. Um, so, I mean, we have that, that sense of the, the internet is a network of networks and what you do with your network, what the rules are in your own network is up to you. That's an autonomous system. But then that needs to be balanced with the need to interconnect, to be interoperable with the rest of the, the internet to gain the value of that global network. Um, so I think, yeah, in that sense, the, the technical principles help us to sort of understand that autonomy itself is not necessarily in conflict with 
that idea of a global network, a global internet. Um, where we do see the tension start to arise, I think is when you do start talking about sovereignty. Um, it's where you start to see that tension between national legal frameworks in the very traditional sense and a global interoperable network. Um, by talking about autonomy, maybe we mitigate the need to take that step to using legal frameworks, using national laws and, and nation states um, by, by creating autonomy in, in technical ways, in social ways, in, in ways that allow more easily for that global inter interconnectivity. Um, so I'll leave it there. I think that's, that's probably the general thrust of my, my discussion today. Thank you, Chris. Um... Over to Katowice, to the room. Um, Rulof, do you want to share your thoughts about what you see as being digital autonomy and perhaps digital sovereignty? Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll avoid um, presenting what I, I would wish it meant. Um, so I'll, I'll just try to give some clarity on what I think that most people mean when they use it. And interesting, the, the, the distinction is already there. I think the discussion or this whole topic started with the term digital sovereignty. Um, and I think at a certain phase, a lot of people said, well, maybe it's not just about states like uh, Chris said. Um, and I think then the, the, the term strategic digital autonomy was launched. And now we have already gotten rid of the strategic part. Um, but I think that's an important thing for, for me. Um, what, what, I, what I see is the context in which this is mostly being used. It's about states or groups of states in the sense of the European Union being able to take their own decisions. So have a choice on um, digital issues that are strategically important. And I think you can also translate that to individuals um, that um, in, in I for me for myself I would like to have a certain level of strategic digital autonomy where I would have a choice on issues in the digital arena that are really critically important to me um, and I think in most cases we would make that choice or we would base that choice on on values that are important to us. And I think also there, the distinction for states is important, that sovereignty is also about having a choice based on the value of the country or the region um, in, in, the, in the strategic digital decisions that you take. Um, and I, if, if we do that well, I don't think that there's a risk um, that we kind of break up the internet into a splinter net. Um, but I think it's also a very, it's quite, it's not a one day project. This is going to take quite some time, both at the personal level, our individual um, strategic digital autonomy, but also on country and regional level. We are, we are very far away from that. And that if you look at other sectors, for instance, energy or food, we are, we are already way beyond the point of no return. So it's interesting that we discuss this now in, in the terms of the internet and digital issues, and why we have already given up in other areas that I think are crucial to us as well. Let me leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, clear, clear, Gurov. Thank you well. Um, uh, Gergana, um, what's your perspective? Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, so the first intervention um, I'd like to make concerns reconciling the differences between, on the one hand, the design of the internet, how the internet was structured, was built, with the ideas that the world as a whole up until present time has of governing, so the general concept of governing and governance. Um, the internet's design departed from traditional centralized structures, um, for example, compared to other communication channels that we had. If you take telephony, for example, if you want to call someone, your request is going to go through a central office, and then from that central office is going to be forwarded on to the person you're trying to reach. Um, in the internet, on the other hand, there is no core or no central office. Um, as Chris mentioned, it's a network of autonomous networks. They're all interconnected. 
So the hierarchy is not there. And that has positives, but also negatives. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with uh, a few negative examples. It can make it a little bit more difficult to implement um, changes. So for example, some standards like um, IP version 6 or DNSSEC or RPKI, they have been a bit slower to implement than we, the technical community, would have liked. Um, and, and the reason for that is that there is no central core that tells all the periphery, you do this or else. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you think about it, when you have a decentralized system, it's a lot more difficult, for example, to attack such a system that has no core. If you take one network out, then the traffic will be rerouted through other networks. And I think one of the biggest strengths is that a distributed model also distributes power to the edge of the networks. And that is what has spurred the so-called permissionless innovation. Um, so as the mantra goes, the core is dumb or passive. And then uh, in the sense that it just transports data indiscriminately, and then um, the edge is smart. Um, so that's what has made the internet as successful as it is today. Um, you know, if you think about the 80s, it just used to be a method of communication between academics. And now it has totally transformed um, our lives for the better, I think. Um, so this decentralization, um, having spurred all the innovation, has, has brought us a lot of value. And now, without going into too much detail, the, so the innovation happens at the top layers or the periphery of the internet, what we call the application layer. And then the lower levels um, where the IP protocols are, uh, the transport layer, those are uh, more passive. Uh, so how does this translate into governance? Um, uh, I think, I mean, if, if you think about, you know, um, power distribution, that is quite a um, new concept to a lot of governments, um, uh, also then, but also right now, that are used to being in charge of making legislation. Uh, they're used to being, you know, the boss. Um, of course, they would consult experts, and many of them did. However, they had the final decision. Um, so for a complex and decentralized system like the internet, top-down decision-making doesn't seem to be a very natural fit. Um, for most of the internet's life, decisions or policies were approved by consensus um, and by technical people in technical fora. Um, so now we're trying to fit this system that, was, that is used to a very horizontal decision-making and decision-making that was done by technical experts we're trying to mold it into our traditional forms of governance, which are very vertical, hierarchical, and are done by politicians. Um, so I feel like at the moment we're in a kind of a juncture. Um, we, we know that we need some sort of, some sort of rules, some policies uh, that would limit the negative effects um, the, of the internet. But at the same time, we want to keep all the positives and we want to keep the innovation. Um, so the, I think the global nature of the internet is essential to much of its value. And uh, while this global nature creates certain risks, there is also the risk that the regional or national policies will fragment the internet and that would diminish its usefulness. So that's more a little bit of an uh, explainer of why we are where we are talking about uh, digital autonomy and sovereignty. Yes, um, I, I, I will wrap up. <laughs> I think that the, the internet tomorrow might look very different and function very different than the internet now if we, if we, don't, if we don't adapt uh, the, form, the traditional form of governance to the internet. Um, and so um, um, for, for the last thing I want to say, uh, I think the EU is now working on a declaration of digital principles. Um, and in September, right, PNCC responded to the open consultation uh, with a recommendation to include a commitment to a globally interoperable and unfragmented internet. And uh, I think that that is a recommendation that we have for policymakers, not just in Europe, but um, all over the globe. Good. Well, um, same question to uh, uh, Lucivis, though. Uh, Lucivis, um, digital autonomy, digital sovereignty. Um, what do they mean to you? So I'm absolutely delighted that the term autonomy was chosen for the session, because as an international lawyer, sovereignty immediately calls uh, into you know all kinds of definitions of 
territory, of nation state sovereignty, uh, things which are actually completely irrelevant uh, in the digital age. And, and I think we have to be very careful about the way we frame this debate, uh, because there are many forces who would love to capture it and make it a political thing. And I think by using the term autonomy, we can focus on what we need to focus on, which is that if we want an interconnected, unfragmented, free internet, which we need for all the reasons that Gergana also explained, you know, for, for our uh, prosperity, for interaction, for being connected, uh, it's extremely important to not allow uh, the black and white forces, as Nadia so nicely called them, um, to to uh, to divide us uh, and make this into a big political debate. I mean, it's one of the few things globally that actually works. Um, so the last thing we should do is politicize it. So I think for me, autonomy, personally, uh, there's the personal autonomy that Rulof also uh, spoke about. Can I still make informed choices uh, when it concerns the digital aspects of my life? And then the other part of it is regional. Uh, you know, some of those choices are limited by where you actually are based. And as a European, for example, I'm extremely happy uh, that we have the GDPR because it means my privacy is better protected uh, than that of the average American. So, so it's it's uh, uh, working together at the two levels of autonomy. And what I, as uh, you know, from my perspective. Of, of end users and consumers, I think one of the things I'm deeply concerned about is that even though we would love to actually have personal digital autonomy, there is a couple of things standing in our way. One, of course, is lack of knowledge. And you see this when you're clicking cookies or other things you need to do to get to some service. Uh, you know, you, you're giving away so many things without actually being aware of it. And I think the way that this uh, kind of has been pushed into the personal choices area is actually not smart because it affects all of us uh, together. So this is why I would very much like to have uh, included in this discussion, like, should there be regulation and, uh, and in what way? Uh, because it's hard to push things to the individual. Um, and then at the regional level, I, I'm very interested, and I see uh, also in the room here, uh, met people from many different regions, uh, is how others are looking at the developments in the European Union, uh, which in many ways is trying to take, take a lead uh, on some of these issues, saying, look, we have to claim our autonomy back uh, from big American tech companies, but also to protect ourselves from forces that are using this free internet to undermine our democracies with misinformation, with other things. So I think I would find it very interesting to see how we can uh, find uh, uh, the right balance to keep our uh, internet free and connected, and at the same time, make sure that we have autonomy um, at the individual uh, and uh, ideally, you know, uh, at the global level as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I think I, uh, I see your hand, Chris. Uh, I, was, I was sort of reflecting on what I heard. I, I think I've heard uh, 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 two things throughout uh, every contribution, uh, namely the, the difference between a, a sort of personal or individual type of autonomy, uh, but also uh, autonomy from, uh, from states or from regional uh, uh, bodies or uh, uh, groups of people, so to speak. And I, I think those are two different discussions when I when I hear people speak a little bit. Um, Chris, you, you raised your hand. Yeah, I, and sorry, I don't mean to throw off any game plan here. I just I, I was wanting to respond a little bit, um, not just to Lucivis, to, to a few of us um, that have spoken here, because I think one thing that's jumped out at me and that I was also thinking a bit about before the session is that that sense that autonomy can and has to exist on multiple layers in multiple ways at, it, at any one time in intersecting ways. So you have personal autonomy, but you also have the autonomy of the state, the, the state, the government to, to sort of look out for its citizens. You have the autonomy of, of private industry, private, private companies who have networks across multiple jurisdictions. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's really an, a never ending negotiation, I think, in how do we manage autonomy to the extent that we want it in all of these different facets that have to intersect with each other. Um, and I mean, I see Milton's point here in, in the chat on Zoom where he says, if you favor regulation, then doesn't regulation come from national governments, which are bound to do things differently and therefore inherently create fragmentation. 
I mean, I think that's a really important point. And I, it comes a bit back to what I was saying in terms of autonomy doesn't need to be just regulation or state control. And really, in, in, an, in a sense, what we should be trying to negotiate towards is minimizing the need for using that regulation and state control. Because once you get into that territory, that's when you're really going to run up against how do we maintain a, a global network of networks. Um, I, and I think, sorry, I'll, I'll finish, but I mean, I'm, it's a sign of how much this has been discussed here and also the quality of the discussions in the IGF that I'm already referencing sessions that just took place yesterday. But there were some really um, good points made in um, one of the last sessions yesterday by Paul Timmers, um, where he was talking about um, the move towards digital sovereignty being um, pushed by external factors, by the sort of rise of global platforms, by the increased risk of cyber events, but that that global shift might mean that some of the, the fragmentation is actually mitigated by a more aligned move towards, okay, what should digital sovereignty look like? How should it intersect with these other forms of sovereignty? Um, I'm not sure I'm necessarily convinced by that, but it's a nice optimistic idea of how it might go. Any of the panelists want to reflect on that thought? Because that I, th I always find that useful. I cannot see you raise hands uh, in the in the halls uh, unless you really stand up. Uh, um. We can keep an eye on uh, Olaf for you here. If there's anybody also in in the room who wants okay. to get up, I just think from my political background, uh, I want to sound a bit of a pessimistic note because uh, governments are very uncomfortable or many governments are very uncomfortable with the way that the internet actually works with the fact that it is multi-stakeholder that it's not run in an intergovernmental way and we see different uh, governments in different places trying to see if they can somehow get control over what's happening on the internet by grabbing control over the technical layer of the internet and i think this is an extremely dangerous development so so it's important that we try to uh, to push back and find solutions for some of the problems they're using as an excuse excuse to, to regulate in order to uh, keep the kind of internet uh, that we want. Uh, and I think in that regard, I'm a little bit less optimistic than perhaps the gentleman that Chris was, was quoting, uh, because the, the push is taking place not here at the IGF, but it's taking place in places like the ITU uh, and other places. And they tend to come from autocratic regimes uh, who, who love to have control over what's happening. And at the same time, we mustn't... Um, underestimate that uh, there are negative aspects uh, to uh, the digitalization and uh, and we have not been able to deal with a number of these precisely because they are global and so it's going to be a constant finding a constant balance of solving the problems on the internet uh, uh, so the governance on the internet without actually touching the technical layer and and explaining what the difference in between those two and the biggest problem there is and I can say this as a recovering politicians is that policymakers generally don't understand any of this. And so we have a huge responsibility, and especially those from the technical community, to keep the dialogue with policymakers, and they change every single time, just when you have one who understands it, they don't get reelected, uh, and then they become a lobbyist for big tech or something like that. So you have to actually keep them engaged, try to bring them here and explain these issues to them, uh, and that's going to be a, an ongoing challenge. And uh, there's uh, Rulof waving. Actually, before you give the microphone to, uh, to to Rulof, I actually have a question to Rulof because he he mentioned something that uh, um, uh, that triggered me here, uh, which is strategic interests. Um, and I always have to think about strategic interests from nation states. I I think of supply uh, uh, supply chains and those type of things, which which keeps societies running. Um, Given that you are in the uh, in the in the in the uh, in the business of providing a critical infrastructure, uh, given that you're in the business of uh, a, a, a service that is uh, a critical supply for many, uh, namely .nl supply uh, .nl domain, um, how do you look towards that? How do you look towards having that conversation about the autonomy in, the, in this case? Uh, that's an interesting question because uh, f um, let me see if I understand your question correctly. But <laughs> let me see if I understand it. For for SIDN, strategic 
digital autonomy is very important because it one it solves the problem of single points of failure and i think that's also something that governments but also we as individuals probably look for on important issues we don't want to have a single point where important things that we have can fail so that's why we don't like facebook why we don't use whatsapp etc right um so for for as I end, the, the ability to choose from different options and uh, avoiding lock-ins, avoiding single points of failure is, is very important. That strategic autonomy is crucial for assuring that the .NL domain always works. But I want, is that, is that kind of a reaction to you? Well, that's yeah, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, okay. most certainly. Yes. Can I react to what Luzuis said? Of course. Because I think although she was one, I think I take politicians and governments a bit slightly more serious than she does. Um, and I would say, yes, there are governments that want to regulate for the wrong reasons. There are governments that regulate wrongly for the right reasons. But there are also a lot of private actors that, um, if I say it unpolitically, misbehave and should be regulated. Um, so, so we have to find a solution to that. And I think we do that by, by, by properly regulated, by precise regulation. So try with the regulation to catch the culprits and not the whole sector. And I think um, if, we, if we look at our um, recent uh, privacy legislation, um, there we called the whole world instead of just the bad actors and then and then but i think that's also a consequence of private parties saying no 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 we don't want any regulation we will self-regulate ourselves which quite a few private actors consider to be no regulation and there's there's kind of a synonym for self-regulation no regulation and um i am from the private sector and i definitely want to stay there i don't want to go to politics nor the government but i'm a realist and i see big private parties misbehaving they are not acting in the in the in our common interest they're acting in the interest of a relatively small group called shareholders or major shareholders and if we don't do something about that i think then we will really get a very bad taste of an internet that nobody of us really wants I, I want to do a little bit of a step back because we were talking about uh, 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 autonomy, uh, the, the uh, ability to be to be autonomous, to act autonomous. Uh, but I think that uh, 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 Nadia brought up a, a, an important sort of a digital divide issue. Some people cannot be autonomous because they cannot participate because they don't have the credit card, for instance, that identifies them. I think that was what I picked up from your from your introduction, Nadia. Can you go a little bit deeper into that possible digital divide? Um, uh, how we can enable uh, people to 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 stay on board, uh, as it were, or come on board, um, uh, uh, and 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 sort of gain their own autonomy. Um, thanks for picking up on that. Um, that is one of my concerns, um, especially when I relate it to Luis Luis's comment about uh, regulations. What if governments don't want to regulate on areas where, um, where, where people don't have access to things? If we're thinking, for example, of refugees that are leaving their countries and their universities have burned down and they have no documentation whatsoever and they come into a new country and they can't participate in the society, therefore not being able to um, get access to bank accounts or uh, general education or um, filing for support, um, then what happens then? Um, so here's where I wanted uh, to, to kind of start raising the issue of that uh, the research that's being done in self-sovereign identity. So in the Netherlands, uh, TYKN and SURF have been researching and developing innovation that's related to self-sovereign identity. And for those who are less familiar with the concept, self-sovereign identity um, kind of introduces this new area, this new paradigm where users 
are, have direct control of their profile information, and it is based on blockchain technology. And um, this gives you a, a wallet and where you exchange information, which is built on, on the trust uh, that you have with each other. And you can know exactly what information is being given to someone and what you're going to be receiving. Because now if I go to a nightclub, well, at the moment, I'm not going anywhere. But if I go somewhere and I show someone my identity card, then you see my name, where I was born, um, when I was born, uh, and all those uh, additional pieces of information, same with when we're logging to a website, et cetera. So um, we then uh, provide more information than we actually expect it to be giving. So there is now this research in, into this self-sovereign identity uh, which then um, kind of provides this opportunity for those people to be involved because government does not wish to, to provide solutions to those who are kind of suffering in those areas. And um, then when it comes about uh, government, um, you know, not getting involved with, with, uh, with kind of the technical components, when, um, if government doesn't want to react in such way, end users, individuals, they will find and use innovation themselves to, to find technical solutions to their problems. And this is one way of moving forward, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other technologic, technological solutions made and created to be able to foster their participation within society. And then if you don't mind me commenting on, um, on, on government and the technical component, yesterday I attended a session um, in which um, there, there was mentioning of, you know, whether or not the splinter net then would happen and uh, if, because of government involvement. And um, I can ask the question when new IP was raised, you know, what are the consequences of what a new protocol can bring and what is the problem the new protocol seeks to resolve? Because um, if, if governments then get involved in a technical layer and they're introducing new things, uh, these are the things that could lead to a splinter net. And, um, I do believe that if we have self-sovereign identity that would work within the existing system and can create perhaps digital sovereignty separately and therefore self-sovereignty. But um, when it comes then to uh, the, the technical layer, there are so many complications in between them that uh, we need to question ourselves um, what kind of innovation is going to be supportive towards the future of the internet. Olaf, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, because I was uh, I was sort of reflecting on this, and and it seems that we're we're hitting almost all uh, corners of uh, internet governance problems from uh, agency of individual users. We already talked about uh, you know uh, uh, will regulation make things easier for users or not? Uh, uh, do we really expect? people to know what cookies mean. Um, now we're talking about uh, uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, attribute carrying a self-sovereign uh, identity. Uh, how much do we expect users to, to, to do that? And will it ever be recognized by, by, uh, by the governments uh, when that matters? Um, and, and then now we're back into uh, 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 networks and, and uh, splintering of, uh, of, of the networks because of different protocols, uh, uh, perhaps even uh, mandated by some governments if, if we don't watch out. Um, uh, uh, let's see, I, I think I saw a hand in, uh, from, from Lucius. Did I see that correctly? I did not, but I see uh, Gergana raising her hand, and that's good because I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, uh, how does this tie in uh, to, to the request that you just made to the European Union uh, for another principle about the internet? Can you, can you say something about that? Um, yes, so, so we, we have asked the European Union to make a stronger commitment to um, an undivided, um, a global um, and interoperable internet. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, um, one thing that I wanted to mention that uh, um, concerns what Nadia was talking about. Um, I also 
share the, the, the doubt, um, all of that you mentioned that to what extent can we rely actually on users and the fact that we need to realize how powerful the options we give to users are. Uh, so they can only operate in the world of the options that they are provided. And oftentimes, um, okay, uh, like we're okay, if users don't like it, they can go elsewhere, but often there's not alternatives. Um, you know, some some platforms, for example, are very uh, are, are so predominant that you know, uh, telling telling users if you don't like it, go elsewhere. That's not really that's not really an option. Um, and then there is also the the side that um, even if users take their individual decisions, uh, those individual decisions can impact um, others. So your individual decision does not. Um, uh, the impact of your individual decision does not stop with you, um, uh, and and we know that you know with uh, um, uh, with machine learning can can get a lot of um, profiling on a certain type of people, and even if you don't share any data about yourself, if you belong to a certain category, they already know quite a lot about you based on the information they have gathered from 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 others. So so. Th th there, we should find some sort of balance between um, individual freedoms and um, what is um, good for society and protect um, uh, freedoms of society as a whole. Um, and um, yes, uh, uh, let me see to, to, to your question, um, uh, what, what we would advise politicians to, to think about is, um, uh, you know, what sort of impact the measures that they're thinking of will have um, within their borders, but also beyond their borders. Um, if you have, um, for example, if you mandate um, um, organizations within your borders to behave such and such a way, that may still impact, um, you know, their relationships with um, organizations or companies uh, beyond their borders, and then you can expect that other governments will take action based on that. So um, yeah, it is, it's, it's very important to think about the long-term impact. And um, often sometimes um, when, when you have some, some measures that, have, uh, th that aim to have a short-term um, effect, they might actually have long-term consequences because of the decisions and measures that the other government takes and then you know like basically what i'm trying to to say it's a lot easier to to not break the system than break it and then try to piece it back together um <laughs> that that is a uh, a true statement also for coffee cups <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> olaf there's a question here yeah, in the I, room. I, um, yeah, yeah like i saw that i yet? saw that that was uh, echoed by mario lane um uh, please go ahead, whoever is in the room. Yeah, and would you please identify yourself uh, for the record? Yeah. <laughs> and not by blockchain. With a digital identity, no. Um, yeah, my name is Julian Ringhoff. I work for the European Council on Foreign Relations uh, in Berlin. And um, we currently work on a lot of projects that touch upon exactly what we are talk uh, talking about here. And uh, we're trying hard to find an ideal state of uh, European strategic autonomy or sovereignty or whatever you want to call it. Um, but at the end, end of the day, of course, it is about uh, securing a, a capacity to act for the European Union to, um, with uh, self-determination in international affairs. And um, we talked a lot about conceptually what an ideal state could be, but I would find it very interesting if some of the panelists could um, take a position on maybe a few selected uh, of the European initiatives in this area, because of course the European Union is doing a lot, whether it is in legislation, AI Act, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, uh, Cybersecurity Act, but at the same time, there are a lot of uh, uh, industrial policies, uh, whether it's uh, the, the CHIPS Act or an alliance for, for cloud, uh, cloud computing. And um, for many of them, there's a lot of criticism that they go too far, that they are protectionist, for example, with the Digital Markets Act. Whereas others, I think, are hailed as, as very good tools to protect the autonomy of European citizens, maybe the Digital Services Act or the AI Act. And I would be very interested if uh, yeah, you could uh, maybe pick a couple of them and say, this is, this is something where we are 
eyeing a, a good state or a good level of European sovereignty or autonomy and maybe others where we are going too far, where we are being protectionist and are threatening uh, to cause a, a splinter net. I, I let's 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 uh, uh, let's zoom into that to that last bit of your question, if I may may focus the question a little bit uh, uh, a little bit. Um, that is, where do you think that the European Commission goes too far and is at risk of creating that splinter net? And there I see Chris Buckridge enthusiastically raising his hand. It gives me a chance to to launch into a more specific story, which is always nice to get down from the, the really high level discussion. No, I, I think it, this this is a really great question. Um, and I, I mean, because I mean, I think the European lawmaking is obviously a really important example um, of, of where this is happening and the ways in which it's happening. Um, so the example I'll talk about a little bit is NIST2. So this is the cybersecurity um, directive, for those not aware. Um, and there's a lot there. It's a, it's a very big, dense um, directive. Uh, I wanna focus really on one very specific part, which has been important for the RIPE NCC. Um, and that's that what it sought to do in the draft originally coming from the, the European Commission was to extend um, obligations, regulatory obligations to root server operators. Now, there are root servers are really the core of, of the DNS. They're an important fundamental part. They're um, the 13 letter root name servers. So A root, B root, um, RIPE NCC is the operator of K root. But the important thing to be aware of about the root server system is that it's not just 13 servers distributed around the world allowing the DNS to actually work. It's hundreds and hundreds of these nodes of these servers around the world which means that the system itself is really resilient, really strong. Now, the European Commission in, in putting this together obviously had concerns about stability of the internet. Now we can talk about how there's not reason to be concerned about that DNS layer, or at least at the root, ser root server level. But the other thing to th think about then is what damage can be done by exerting European regulatory authority over the root name server system, which is what this essentially would do because this is a global system. And what you're essentially saying is that if the EU, the European Commission says, the root server system is so critical to European internet users that we need to bring it under, under regulation, then what's to stop the Russian government saying the root server system is so important to Russian internet users, we need to bring it under regulation. The Australian government, the Japanese government, the rest of the world basically. And at that point, you've essentially broken and politicized what was a really well-crafted apolitical system, which had managed for 30 years to go without any downtime on allowing the root server system, I'm uh, sorry, the DNS um, to actually operate and allow us to use the internet. So that's, that's one really quite clear example of the danger. Now, just to very quickly um, finish there, and, and again, it's a perhaps a slight retort to Lucy. Very quickly, Center. Chris, very quickly. Very quickly is just to say what we've had is some really good um, progress in this area in talking to the European Council, in talking to parliamentarians at, at that level, it looks like in the final draft um, that's agreed in Trilog that won't be included. So that's been a really positive experience, but it has taken a lot of work and effort on the part of not just the RIPE NCC, also the Internet Society, others, um, Netnode, um, and others in the internet technical community. And I think a big compliment to Chris and, and all the others who, who made that happen because it's, it's, it, it would have been a dreadful precedent if it had gotten in there. So congratulations. Um, I, I believe it's still not a run race, so to speak. It's so uh, please continue to pay attention, uh, but that's not my role as, uh, as moderator of this panel. Um, in Katowice, Rulof or Luzevis, do you have examples perhaps of... Uh, of, of. You want to go first? Well, no, I don't want to actually uh, uh, give any examples. There's something uh, I do, do want to react to Julian's comment because uh, I think on some of these, for example, the AI, uh, it's it's too early to tell. Uh, and two concerns from the consumer, uh, from the transparency aspect uh, that we have is the first is that we there it takes a huge counter lobby to have uh, the 
the big tech lobby influence to counter that. And it is, if you look at the report, for example, of the Corporate Europe Observatory about the, the money that is being spent by big tech to try to get the regulation to go into their direction, it shows that there's a huge effort in, in the, the example that Chris gave. It went well, but it doesn't always go well. So I think that's one. And the second thing is, and then I want to zoom in specifically on the AI oversight board, is that uh, it's going to be extraordinarily important. Uh, we're going to have to see how it develops. But one of the interesting things, and we put that into the consult consultation, was that uh, the financial interests of these people are not public yet. I mean, when and it's one of the things that we should know. If you're smart enough or uh, know enough about AI to be on this oversight board, I would very much like to know where your investments are. And I want to make sure that when you're taking decisions or when you're developing policy, that you're not doing it for your own pocket. So we need transparency on that. So that's why I'm saying as this starts to develop, we have to make sure that we, we keep an eye on lobbyists, that we keep uh, things transparent, and that we know what per people's personal and financial interests are, because that's the only way we can make sure that all of this legislation starts to develop for the common good uh, instead of us finding out later, oh my goodness, you know, again, we've fallen into the, the trap that we're trying to, to not fall into. Um, Rulof, Nadja, or Gergana, do you have any, any uh, additional response to uh, Julian? Otherwise, we'll yep. go to the uh, mic line in Poland. Yep. Can I? Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, my, my reaction will be that in almost all cases, regulation overshoots its purpose. Um, and, and I don't have a solution for that, but it always takes a lot of lobbying afterwards. And lobbying is probably the wrong term because it's not about the interest of the organization that does the lobbying, not if it's the technical sector, I think. Um, but it, there are so many in the NIS, NIS 1, NIS 2, um, DSA, there's so many examples of where the, the intention probably is justified and um, I'm a realist like I said so I th we cannot do without regulation and we need more regulation also in our industry um, but in most cases the, we I think we spend more time correcting the legis the, the, the regulation than than the original people who made it spend on it coming up with it um, and I think you also probably between the lines refer to Gaia X and DNS for EU. And I, well, there's still no clear picture on what DNS for EU now really is about. Um, the, the, the signals that we get from, from, from the European Union are a bit mixed. Uh, so one is, no, it's just going to be a fair and open European DOH and other a new protocol serving DNS um, installation, but in, Sometimes we also hear, and I think that was a signal that came from the high level interest group, that this is going to be clean DNS uh, for EU. So all kinds of things will be blocked and filtered so that you get a really safe environment where you can get your uh, DNS services from. And that's probably, again, regulation overshooting its purpose. Thank you, uh, Rulof. Uh, in the meantime, I've asked uh, Nadia and uh, Gergana if they had something to add, but we feel uh, that it's better to go to uh, the mic line in, in Katowice. Alexander, can you identify? Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Alexander Savnin from uh, Moscow. Uh, sorry for rushing in uh, to this Dutch party, uh, but I have exactly a question to you, because, for example, uh, distribution of IP addresses were very autonomous. Uh, till um, European Union imposes some sanctions. And RIPE and CC have discovered that, for example, people in Syria cannot uh, obtain IP addresses just because European sanctions doesn't allow them. So that's an issue which, well, usually could not be discussed, but it was discussed by previous RIPE meeting. And what to do for people in Syria, how, 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 how to do them? Uh, that's a question for you Dutch people, sorry, uh, for ruining your party. Uh, but I can give another positive uh, example. If you don't like DNS, how it runs now, uh, you can do your autonomous uh, DNS with open root or alt root. Uh, here's on IGF, physically Leo Puzin, with who provides you with such form of DNS. Is it also autonomous? Is it suitable for you? In some cases, will you use it? Uh, alternative uh, .nl, for example. So are these uh, non-autonomous? and another very autonomous examples uh, good for us and how to react to them. 
we are no longer can just ignore or saying that nothing is happening. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander. Um, um, there is another question from the hall, I understand. Let's take that question and then I'll give uh, Gergana the opportunity to respond to your first question because I think this is a typical RIPE NCC question and then we see where if we have some time left. Go ahead in the hall with the question that you have. Hi there, I'm Colin Curry. I'm joining from Ofcom, which is uh, the UK's independent communications regulator. I really like this image of the kind of overlapping and different sizes of, of autonomy that we've painted during this session. But it made me think about um, good governance principles like fairness, accountability, or transparency, which can equally be applied to public or private endeavors, or indeed, perhaps to personal autonomy as well. So I wondered if the panelists had any reflections on how uh, these concept of a, accountability or good governance or responsibility could be delineated or monitored where you have kind of potentially overlapping and confusing levels of autonomy. So yeah, um, uh, Ger uh, Gergana, if you want to take the first question and then we'll round off uh, by giving everybody just 30 seconds to, um, to give their opinion about the complicated space in which we have to uh, uh, to govern, um, because these are all questions. This is basically a question about how to govern in a in a complicated space. Um, Gergana, go ahead, and then a quick round. Yeah, thanks, Olaf. I'll be quick. So, we, yeah, uh, concerning sanctions, it is something that uh, um, uh, has impact right and CC's operations. Um, uh, our board came uh, with a position or as far back as 2014, um, and uh, that was that we believe that internet resources should be kept separate from political disputes, especially having in mind how fundamental connectivity has become to our societies. Um, we are concerned that um, sanctions that are in some way uh, restricting the use of the um, internet number resources in some uh, countries will continue to put pressure um, on the existing system of internet governance. And we are um, currently um, uh, in talks with the EU. Uh, we are investigating the possibility of getting an exemption um, of internet number resources um, from EU sanctions regulation. Um, I will put in the chat a link to an article with a lot more information on this. Transparency, accountability in a uh, distributed and slightly overlapping environment of many topics. Your thoughts, Nadia? When it comes to um, to to all these different concepts, I I really come back to the idea of the political narrative and, and where it really matters to our day-to-day -day functions. And when you see that, uh, how important that is to individuals, how we have these discussions about what do we let people see and urging people to uh, regain our privacy and uh, regain our transparency and people taking action to, um, to provide these systems uh, through this self-sovereign identity system, I see that, um, that there are continuous efforts for people to look at these uh, different principles. There was a, an RF, RFC, um, I can't remember the exact number, but it was co-authored by Nielsen Ufer, um, which looked at uh, different components of, uh, of technical development and human rights uh, and um, how these interlink with each other. So this has been a, a topic of thought that continues and is being um, promoted and continuously debated um, to be included. The way that we then need to make forward is to ensure by your question, but also by, um, ra by raising this, then come back into our communities, raising this information that is then being shared through all these different spaces to raise that uh, to the attention of policymakers. As Lucy was mentioned earlier, um, we, we try to keep people informed of developments that are happening. And when they then go back, uh, if they don't get reelected and go back into the communities, we lose that valuable information. It's then um, a, a way for us to come back together and uh, to kind of really ensure that these uh, topics continue to be on the agenda. I think that will just need to be an effort that come from, <clears throat> excuse me, that comes from all of us 
Uh, and I do hope that we can continue and foster that type of research and support those who, um, who make those efforts. Thank you, Nadia. Over to Chris. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I, I think Colin raised a really interesting question there. Like when we talk about all of these different autonomies, how do we actually then manage the intersections of all of those? Um, the best answer I have is the IGF. I, I think that really is sort of a delib deliberative processes where we come together and sort of talk about, analyze, think about the, the ways in which accountability is being enacted and protected um, and, and governance is taking place. That, that's the role of the IGF. And it doesn't need to be a sort of uber regulator power. It just needs to be a place where some transparency is brought to bear, where some sunlight comes in on, on how this is all being done. And hopefully we can all improve over time. Yeah, to me, the word collaboration always comes to mind when I think about these type of, of processes. Um, Gergana, do, do you want to say a final word on that topic? Uh, yes, uh, very quickly. Uh, I think that the point that uh, Luis Avis made earlier uh, is worth repeating, and, and that is the differentiating between the, the top layer, the applications layer, and technical layers underneath. Um, I think regulators should be careful not to break or change the technical core of the internet uh, when uh, trying to come up with uh, regulation on how the internet is used. Um, and then when you're thinking of legislation, try to think of what you're trying to achieve, what your end goal is, whether it's privacy or security, rather than how to get there. Um, the technical bits um, uh, can be, of course, discussed in technical forum. Um, so that's uh, that's uh, what I wanted to close with. Thank you. Um, and, and given that we're actually over time, I'm going to thank everybody. Uh, before I give the opportunity to Hulov and, and Lusevis, but I'm, I'm going to return the mic to Katowice. And, and with that, I'm going to thank everybody for their uh, attention. But first, let's let's wait for, for uh, Lusevis and, and Rudolf's answers. Yeah, we have a big minus two minutes uh, blazing right in front of us. So there's not, not a lot of pressure here. Uh, no, thank you, Gargana, for, for making that point, because I think this is uh, repeating my point, because I think we cannot uh, repeat often enough the difference between the technical layer of the internet and what happens on it, the applications. And it's in incredibly important to keep repeating that to, uh, to policymakers and to explain the difference to them, uh, because that's the way we're going to avoid fragmentation. And the second point is the point that, uh, that Chris uh, made uh, is extremely important that we keep these discussions in the IGF because it's more open, it's more transparent than anything they're going to do between governments. Plus, when governments get together, a lot of other interests are at play. Uh, there's economic interests, uh, there's uh, you know countries that are indebted to other countries that are not free to speak, whereas here at IGF, we get a lot more real, open, honest debate and therefore better governance and better accountability. So my call is also for people who are in those intergovernmental fora, uh, maybe the lady from Ofcom has good connections to the British government, uh, to say, whenever they try to put these issues in the ITU, in the UN or at other places, uh, say, no, we have a forum for that. It's called the IGF. You have an issue to raise, you do it there because here we can really counter them in a completely different way than all those polite diplomats with their other interests uh, around. They're important too, but I think for these kind of issues, multi-stakeholderism is the only way to go. You have your own microphone. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, there's now three minutes, 52 seconds uh, in red in front of me. So um, I think I'll, I'll thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to the room for participating. And uh, it was a good session, I think, because we didn't mention breaking up big tech in the context of autonomy. So that's pretty good. <laughs>